and opinions expressed by callers, guests, and hosts do not necessarily reflect those of the Black Talk Radio Network and Black Talk Media Project. Black Talk Radio is new black media for the new millennium. Good morning, good morning, good morning. This is Change Matters, and I am Colette Williams, and I am broadcasting live from Phoenix, surprise, somewhere in Arizona. We are broadcasting live, and it is a cold, cold 40-something degree day. It rained all night, and the sky is blue. It is probably a little warmer, but it is certainly a, a cold, cold morning. This is Colette Williams, and we are broadcasting live from Surprise, Arizona. Thank you for joining us this morning. Ken. And this is Kenny Hendricks, and yes, we are on the morning here in Surprise, Arizona, and actually it's about 50 degrees. It's a beautiful day. Still cold. Today, Tuesday, Tuesday uh, January 24th, and we're going to have an exciting show, as we always do. We thank you for joining us, and if you want to join us, and if you want to join the conversation, Colette, would you like to give those numbers out? Yes, the numbers are 866-510-9025. That's 866-510-9025. And you can also hit us up at changematters99 at gmail. That's changematters99 at gmail. The numbers to call in and join the conversation this morning are 866-510-9025. And thank you for joining us. We do have a guest on. Things that he said about uh, Mr. Damien Square from San Francisco State University, Northern California, of course. And he is joining us this morning to talk about how the millennials feel about the state of black America. And I'm not sure if he's on yet. I can't tell. I really can't see it. I can't see it. But we're glad that he is joining us. And he's got some views and news from the millennial perspective, and he actually came to us because he did call in um, several shows ago, and we were so intrigued by the things that he mentioned to us that we had to get him back here, we had to get him on, and we've got to keep in touch because this young man has a lot to say. He's an organizer at San Francisco State, and he is organizing a movement. And he's going to talk to us about that movement. He's going to talk to us about uh, the millennials and and the views of the millennials and the things that have been going on in the black community and what he and the rest of the organization are doing to change things that are going on in the black community and the area in which he lived. So we are glad that Damien Square is here with us, and he's going to tell us about himself. Damien, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Damien Square. Damien, as we get started, why don't you tell us about yourself? I introduced you as a student from San Francisco State. So tell us from the beginning uh, about you, where you've come from, where you're going, the things that you're involved in. We would like to know, our audience would like to know. So let's start with that. Go ahead. All right. So. My name is Damien Square. Um, I'm originally from Alabama, a small town in Alabama called Smith Station. And uh, my mom had me when she was a teenager. And um, after she had me, she went into the military. And from there, you know, I was able to travel all around the world. I've lived in two different countries. I've lived in 
five different states within the United States and I uh, do a lot of traveling throughout my life. But um, at the end of the day, I end up moving to California after my parents, after we moved back to um, the South. I moved to California to kind of get outside of my comfort zone, find out who I was, what I wanted, and what I'm truly, truly capable of as a young black male. Um, so when I came up to California, I have some family that are from Oakland, that are from the, this, this, the Bay Area, and I uh, moved in with an with a uncle and slept on his couch as I enrolled myself into college and I tried to figure out exactly what it is that I wanted to do with my life. And I found a college called Santa Rosa Junior College. And unbeknownst to me at the time, Santa Rosa Junior College was the top three, within the top three junior colleges in the entire country. And I just happened to get luckily enrolled in that in that junior college. So that is where I cut my chops as like an activist. And that's where I mm. first started getting my activist roots and it happened through a series of racially provoked events that I encountered as a student from teachers at the college and um, you know I don't really want to go into the detail of those particular incidents but uh, just the incidents were so heightened that I almost got expelled from the school due to me challenging the teacher on the fact that uh, not only were they using the N-word, but they were showing pictures that degraded, you know, black men and black women without giving the proper historical context to why you were showing those pictures in the first place. Uh, wow. So after that, after those series of events happened, happened, there was a there was an event at the at the junior college where former governor uh, Willie Brown came to the school, and Willie Brown, if you don't know him, he's a, a sure. former mayor, I think, of San Francisco. Uh, mm -hmm. at, at one point, African American man, real civil rights type of individual, definitely did things to help out the black community. But anyway, he came to the school. He had a real powerful speech about uh, things that the black community needs to do. Uh, the Central Rose Junior College is a predominantly white school. Um, but when I see him, when I saw him come to the school and he talked about these things that you know we as a uh, black people need to be doing, I went up and asked him a question about the the prison industrial complex. Um, and he didn't give me a straightforward answer on that question. But the the surprising thing about that was it was a young gentleman that was in the back of the room who go who went to that same school, San Jose Junior College, and uh, he, I guess, saw something in the way that I answered, asked the question or he liked the way I asked the question, and he approached me about, you know, hey, I'm really trying to start a black student union here at this school because uh, we don't have any representation. And I was like, we don't have any representation. And mind you, this is after the series of racial events. So, I'm, so me and him and this other young woman who goes to the University of UC San Diego right now, we three came together and we started the first black student union at this junior college in over 10 years. So the, mm. there was no black student union at this junior college in over 10 years. Mind you, the biggest one of the top junior colleges in the nation. Um, so we put together this this uh, Black Student Union, and this was around 2013, 2013. We put together this Black Student Union the following semester, and we really wanted to let that junior college know that, hey, black students are here, we're organized, and we're about to show y'all, you know, what we're really about. So we put together this fundraiser to send five of us over to Tanzania, Africa, to build mm -hmm. a school for about 50 orphan Tanzania children. And... Um, in the process of doing that, we raised over $18,000 doing bake sales, writing up proposals, presenting those proposals to various businesses, churches in the community, um, raised over $18,000, shattered every single uh, fundraising record for a student club in the entire state of California, and became the first student club to use their own funds to send a group of their own peers to a third world country. Um, and the wow. Center of the Junior College got an accreditation through the work that we did. The, the school still stands in Arusha, Tanzania to this day. And, you know, over there we met, um, you know, Pete O'Neill and Charlotte O'Neill, both are um, Black Panthers. Pete O'Neill in particular is a Black Panther who is in exile, who can't come back to um United States of America, right. but he has a compound in Tanzania that was given to him by a former president of Tanzania who recognized that he was a panther in exile. And, I, you know, back in that time, you know, panthers had a, a, a lot of clout. Um, it's not a lot, not like today. But, you know, um, in doing that, that's where I really 
got my real roots as an activist and from that particular event I recognize my inherent power as both a young black male and recognizing my um, leadership abilities and to whom much is given, much is expected. So once I yeah, recognized absolutely. my own inherent self-worth, I had an obligation to to build on that and to focus on that. And that's what I've been doing since then. Since then, we've started um, black student unions in various numerous high schools and middle schools in this local area. Um, I get requested to come speak at these high schools um, to these children. I mentor and tutor youth in this community. Um, yeah, we I've, I've uh, we started a a, um, a a belly full program, which is a program here at this junior college. There was a lot of oh, a, what a program? Team, uh, a belly full program, which basically addressed the lack of nutrition and the lack of proper uh, diet. basically for lack of words, food. Yeah, diet that these students were getting. The football team at the school that is predominantly white is a predominantly black football team. I mean, a lot of these guys, they ship them from out of state. Um, so these guys, between school, between you know work, practice, homework, they don't have time to adequately feed themselves because a lot of them don't even have jobs and things like that. So um, there was a story where we heard about like five or six of the football players pitching in 50 cents and a dollar to go across the street to get a $5 large pizza from Little Caesars before a football game. And this is what the football players were running off of, like sheer athleticism and garlic bread. So once I heard that, I was like, oh, hell, hell no. So we, um, <laughs> put together, we put together a fundraiser, and we started raising funds to feed these football players, black and white and brown, um, to feed these football players before their home games and away games. Um, and it cost about $300 per game, and they got a game every week. So we fundraised that, and... Um, set them pasta and salad before every single game. Um, I, I don't want to say that the school was shamed by it, but the school was so proud of what we did and to some extent shamed by it that they kind of adopted that program. And now it's become a program that is called Belly Full that is now being kind of taken over by the college at large. And they're feeding not only athletes but all students. So it's something that the Black Student Union did that kind of recognized an inherent problem that the school had, and um, they jumped on that because they were getting a lot of negative press due to the fact that the Black Student Union was going out of their way to raise funds to feed hungry students on their campus. Um, and we do a lot of other various things throughout the community as well. So that's kind of everything that I'm doing and have been doing in a nutshell. Wow. So long, how long has it taken you to do all this, and what period of time have you done it? Because it sounds like you've done a great deal. So oh, how, oh, long, how long has it, what kind of time frame, when you raised well, the money to go to, to, go to uh, Tanzania, when you raised the money, the Belly Full program, in what period of time? Is this over a period of what, two, three, four, five, six years, or, or what? Oh, no, 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 no. We raised the money to go to Tanzania in a single semester. We raised 18000 Oh, it was about a, a semester and a half, because so we started at the end, the tail end of the previous semester, and we came into the other, the new semester, which a semester is about four months, um, and we raised $18,000 in four months, and we sent our, we sent us over there in, in, uh, in the fifth month. So from January... From January to May, we fundraised, and in May we went to Tanzania. Um, as far as the um, the belly full and feeding the football players, we were fundraised on Mondays and Wednesdays, or we were fun. We would do bake sales on Tuesdays and Wednesdays at school, and then we would have our um, football dinners on Friday. So mm -hmm. each bake sale, we would make about between one hundred and fifty to one hundred and twenty dollars, and then we were um, I got really good at writing proposals to various organizations within the school, SGA, uh, Student Equity, writing proposals to them to solicit money from them to give us money to help us put these dinners on. And it got to the point to where we were raising our own money to put these dinners on. It got to the point to where these various organizations, Student Government Association, Student Equity, these teacher bodies, they started to come to the Black Student Union, me as the president, to... Um, 
give us money, saying, like, we want to give you money to help you with this because they wanted to have their stamp on that program to say that, yeah, sure. we helped the Black Student Union do this. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. the time frame was, you know, relatively small. Uh, for less than six months to raise the money to go to Tanzania and a week, you know, it took us two or three days throughout the week to raise the money for the football games every uh, Friday. So, uh, Damien, this is uh, Kenny Hendricks. So from um, the faculty standpoint, what has their response been to all of your activity, particularly with, with, with uh, creating the Black Student Unions? I know that uh, back in the 60s and 70s, we had these Black Student Unions at school, and it seems like that had gone by the wayside. But is there a resurgence of that? And again, what has been the response from the faculty of these various institutions? There has definitely been a resurgence of uh, black activism on college campuses throughout the country and the government as a whole is very like they're noticing that and like mind you we have to remember that the Black Panther Party started at a community college in Oakland Laney Community mm -hmm. College sure did that's right the Black mm -hmm. Student Union the, 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 the Black Panther Party was birthed out of the Black Student Union and believe you me the government they know that um, so to answer your question as far as how they've been responding, the response has not been well. You know, they are very, very intimidated by students organizing on campuses because they know that that is the key. That is the key to unlocking the impending revolution that is about to take place. But when students organize in mass around a particular issue, there's very little that the powers that, can, that be can do to stop that other than, you know, an out-and-out -out militarized response. Um, and that's what we've been seeing. Uh, and this college in particular, they've been very clandestine in how they've been handling us. But they've been, you know, putting up various barriers. They made it hard for us to go to Tanzania. They had us sign all kinds of liability waivers that said that if we got kidnapped in Tanzania, if anything happened to us, that the college would not be in any way, shape, or form responsible. responsible. But, of course, when we came back, they definitely wanted some credit. So, um, right. and I don't really want to get into, like, the particulars of the personal matters that happened within this Black <clears throat> Student Union, but it was a lot of term, it was a lot of things that transpired. And uh, just to give you a little tip piece of that, one of our advisors that helped us start this Black Student Union is no longer at that college. Is no longer at San Jose Junior College, and he actually, you know, is in litigation with the San Jose Junior College over, you know, uh, racial discrimination and and wrongful, you know, termination and things like that because there was a lot of pressure that was put on him as a black man because he was like the apex of our organization. We we. We went to him for a lot of our, we got a lot of our support for him. He had a, he was um, like the director of the assistant, the assistant dean of student affairs on the campus. So he had a lot of connections within the college and within the community. And the school started putting a lot of pressure on him. And that pressure over a period of a year or two, like, exploded and imploded and he ended up leaving. He's no longer at the junior college. He, you know, teaches at Berkeley now. And now the advisor for the Black Student Union at SRJC is a white male. And, you know, things have shifted a lot because they recognize the power. You said who's at SRJC? The, the advisor for the Black Student Union at Santa Rosa Junior College in California is a white male. Which you know he's a white man who said. he's a white man who he told us um, that before yeah right he has activist background and whatnot but you know there was there's some you know for me personally there was a lot of I'm cool with this guy but there was a lot of you know I don't know resistance from that because that inherently houses its own problems. But I would like to say that his heart is in the right place. It's just that as him being a white man, you can never understand the str you can never understand the struggle of a 
of a black youth, of a black student. Right. So mm -hmm. with that, how effective can you be as an advisor for a black student union? And once I brought that to his attention, he got offended by that and actually resigned. But, um, yeah, we're, make, we're trying to make the progress that we can, and uh, we're moving forward. Wow. That's a lot. So to answer your, so, so to answer your question, yes. Okay, so this guy resigned. Okay. Well, tell us more about what's going on at San Francisco State, San Francisco State University, and what has happened with other universities across the country. You began up north, and has it trickled down into Southern California, and what other states are you involved in with either developing a black student union or keeping the fight going, keeping the movement going? And can you tell us about your movement and what you're doing and what your mission is? Right. Well, I'm very new to San Francisco State. I just transferred, so I'm really now just getting in the mix of everything over there. Um, coming from the other college, like I co-founded that Black Student Union and president of that one over there and leading that one, so I'm already going to affirmatively get me a position within the Black Student Union at the state. But there's definitely a lot of um, activism that is happening along the coast of California when it comes to Black Student Union. Um, there's something called the African Black Coalition, which is basically a large event that just took place in, oh, man, um, it just took place in, I, I can't remember the city, in Southern California, but actually uh, Dr. Boyce Watkins and Louis, Louis Farrakhan Dr. Boyce actually Watkins. were the, Dr. Boyce Watkins and Louis Farrakhan were both uh, keynote speakers at the African Black Coalition. And the African Black Coalition wow. is, a coalition of all of the black student unions from the UC campuses and the Cal State University campuses across the entire state of California. So uh, San Francisco State Black Student Union is there. Cal, uh, UC Berkeley's Black Student Union there. Uh, UCLA's Black Student Union is there. Uh, um, Cal State Los Angeles Black Student Union is there. All of the black student unions from all of the various CSUs and UCs go to this event and it's a massive event full of wow. young black beautiful black women beautiful black wow. men that are all, I'm talking about thousands of students that are all there and they are so active they are so on top of it they are so like ready to get down and they're missing that that eldership they're missing that that leadership, and this is a bunch of young, driven, educated, highly educated, highly motivated young brothers and sisters that are ready to get on the ground, and they're already doing things, but they're ready to take what they're doing and take it to the next level, take it to the national level. So this wow. is something that has quietly been being done, and, um, you know, I've, I've kind of baffled that no larger organizations have really taken notice to it. Um and I'm, uh, I'm also shocked. I'm really shocked. You know what, Damien, as you're talking about that, I'm thinking the march, the marches, plural, that took place over the weekend were massive. So how is it what you're talking about hasn't done the same thing? There should be, we should be marching. There should, if you're talking about organizations that have come together, that are growing, that are um, involved in the plight, they have a clear mission. What are, we, what are we lacking? This call to action that took place by one white woman, she just put out there on Facebook, let's march. And it was a worldwide march. So there were millions of people that marched over the, week, with the, the weekend on Saturday millions of people and how do we come together and do the same thing as the black community so what, do you, what is your recipe for that if you're talking about massive numbers of people that came together for this event how do we do the same thing to march for what we know black people need in their community that's a good question um well, first well of if they all, came together, say, <clears throat> if it was Louis Farrakhan yeah. and Boyce Watkins, 
that pulled this together, or people came no, they, together they because they together. They did. They, no, they they definitely the African Black Coalition is an event that has been taken at play, that has been taking place in California amongst these Black Student Unions for like uh, I want to say around five years now. This is a massive event that these guys got invited out to by these Black okay. students. Okay. So, um, yeah. How many people uh, do you F- think were there? You said massive numbers. So what does what is that? What over is massive? over over a thousand or over fifteen hundred. Black students. Okay. From all yeah, over California. Hey, Damien, it's with you again. A um, yes. couple of questions. Uh, one is, do you guys have a social media presence? Is there a Black Student Union in uh, UC San Francisco, Black Student Union Facebook page? Are you guys on Twitter? What are you guys doing on, on social media? Is there anything out there um, that puts this stuff to, to let people know what's going on? Because obviously the mainstream media is not picking it up and they're not going to pick it up and we have to stop relying on the mainstream media to do that media to do that. But uh, do you guys have a presence out there? Right. Well yeah, the African Black Coalition, they really don't they didn't they didn't put this stuff out on um on social media. And a lot of the black student unions really don't put themselves out on social media like that. I know Sacramento State, they have a uh, um, Facebook and a YouTube channel. Uh, San Francisco State, they have social media also. Um, you can check us out on Facebook and whatnot. Uh, but the social media platforms for these organizations aren't as thoroughly built as they should be. But right now, uh-huh. that's not the focus. Right now, the focus is actually getting people organized on the ground and really doing things on the mm-hmm. ground and not really being there to take pictures on social media to show everybody hey, look what we're doing, look who we are. That's a different set of, of organizers that are participating in that. Um, and so there's so a reason yes. for that, is that correct? Yes, there's a reason for that. Okay, okay, I, I, I do understand that, okay. Well, well yeah. I, I, I guess uh, being, you know, students, millennials, churches, uh, what have you, I, I'm surprised that a uh, lot more, because as I see it, as being a boomer, I see you know, everything being from the younger generation being done out on social media. I was going to just mention that the woman put out that one Facebook post and it turned into a worldwide march. So I, I'm wondering, should some focus be there as well? Is, is, is that something? That, and it sounds to me like possibly there may need to be some more focus on that social media platform because that gets the word out and perhaps that would, that would help things. Well, definitely there. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of social media communication that is happening. Uh, between the various groups with uh, community organizers, particularly student activists, with the, with the African Black Coalition, there's like um, there's private <clears throat> messaging that is going on behind the scenes and invitations that is going on behind the scenes. Because again, to to even come to the African Black Coalition and participate, you have to be a member of the Black Student Union within one of these campuses. So it's not like an open invitation to send like send out a mass call. Um, but to go back to Colette's question about how do we get the same response from our people like this Women's March, first we have to be able to align ourselves on a common thread in the way that the mm-hmm. Women's March has been. Like, sure. What we're really trying to do as, like, black youth right now is really kind of point out the fact that we are a nation within a nation. And until we start operating like that with a common thread of a particular ideology that runs through and through the black community it's going to be hard for us to galvanize collectively in mass like that you know those women sure. they galvanize in that way behind there's a common thread between all of those women that organized that's right um, and marched you know and we right. don't share that same common thread right now. Absolutely. And it's and, and it's not that we don't share the same kind of common thread. It's that we have an an enormous amount of division and where people think, No, that's not necessary, we've already made it, uh, I'm not involved in that, I'm a repub, that stuff is crazy, we finished with that, Black Panthers, that's too militant. So we're all over the gamut. We we run the gamut of division. 
And before we go any further, I've got to go to station break, and we've also got to pay some bills. So we're going to come right back to you, and this is Change Matters, and I am Colette Williams. And if you care to join the conversation, and I certainly hope that you do, the number is 866-510-9025. That's 866-510-9025. And we are going to go to station break and a commercial, and we'll be back. Real estate and apartment locators are based in Dallas, Texas, serving all areas of the Dallas Central Plex, specializing in residential, commercial real estate, as well as apartment locating. We are your one-stop shop for all your real estate needs. Allow us to bring first-class real estate to your real estate needs. We have Why Fly Coach when you can fly first class. It's only the best. Your first-class real estate professional. Jocelyn Bagby at 682-888-8417. Be sure to call your real estate professional at First Class Real Estate, Jocelyn Bagby at 682-888-8417. And you are tuned in to the Black Talk Radio Network. For podcasts and live program scheduling, visit us on the web at blacktalkradionetwork.com. And we are back. This is Change Matters Solutions. This is Kenny Hendricks. And this week we have Damien Square as our guest, a student from San Francisco University and an activist in the community. And we've got a lively conversation going on. If you'd like to join the conversation, Colette, would you like to give those numbers out, please? Sure. 866-510-9025. That's 866-510-9025. And if you'd like to hit us up on our email, that's Change Matters 99 at Gmail. That's Change Matters 99 at Gmail. Call us at 866-510-9025. And if you'd like to comment or question, hit star, star, and we will bring you up. Let's continue on. And our guest this morning is Damien Square from San Francisco State University, and he is an organizer. Damien, let's continue. This is intriguing to me. So let's continue the conversation. Uh, Kim, what was your question before we went to break? Okay, so I was talking about social media and um, <clears throat> how possibly more of this information needs to be out on social media. Uh, I'm a boomer. We didn't obviously grow up with social media, but I do see how it, how it helps things. And in fact, um, something you may might be interesting to you, uh, Damien, is that Black Talk Radio has a social media platform that Scotty can talk to you about. But that might be a way to get the message out as well. But um, and, and we were talking about the division within the black community. Maybe that's the reason that a lot of this information isn't out there. Right. Um, but but we need the, the information. I think you know some tremendous things, and I think it, it, it it's kind of um, kind of sad that more people don't know what's going on. We have to be responsible for getting that information out there. Um, and I read a lot of things on Facebook and people saying, you know, "Why is the media showing this? Why is the media so that?" You know, we, we, we should not be relying on them. We've got these vehicles to get that information out there, and we should use them. And this is not a criticism by any stretch of the imagination, Damien. I just want to talk this through. So, um, you know, just, just as a thought, maybe some additional uh, social media type information might uh, be uh, some help to get the message out. Damien, is there hesitation, resistance, uh, some uncertainty about taking this to social media because it exposes so much of you and it lets the masses know about things that uh, might bring harm or what's the idea? And I do remember when we were in high school, uh, junior high school, uh, I remember wiretaps. I remember our phone was mm-hmm. tapped. There was no question whatsoever as to whether or not our home phone, 6819204, boy, that was 60 years ago, 6819204. I know that that phone was tapped. I know that. And we had so much activity going on at my mother's home. 
that I'm sure it was thought that we were uh, a huge part of the organization. We were, but we weren't. But I know that that number was tapped and they were listening in. We know that for a fact. So do you have the very same kind of uh, fear and discomfort and uncertainty? Do you have that? Yes, there was a time where I was pretty paranoid in the in the black student. Not paranoid as far as scared, but it was just sure. a time where I um, was always questioning everything, not trust, not trusting anything, especially when that situation happened where our advisor started to become under a lot of heat because of the racism that he was experiencing in the workplace, and then all of these people from from different places started to come in and be involved in the Black Student Union and it was it was weird and again I I, I kind of draw the correlation between like what happened with Laney College and the Black Student Union and then that turning into the Black Panther Party and I'm pretty sure a lot of our listeners know about COINTELPRO the domestic the covert domestic terrorism program that was started by the United States government i.e. the FBI with the main goal of, you know, breaking apart, dismantling, discrediting uh, black organizations to prevent the rise of the next black messiah. So they are paying very, very close attention to college campuses. And that definitely plays a role in to why a lot of this stuff is not getting out. But I think another part of that is that a lot of these students are very young, you know, 18, 19, 20, and they're coming into their, their activist group their activist self, their activist roots and whatnot, they're finding their lane within that. And a lot of these things, they're, they're way more focused on actually doing things than showing everybody else, look, this is what we're doing. And student clubs, black student unions on campuses, they're different than, like, outside organizations like uh, New Era Detroit or Malcolm X Grassroots Movement or Young, Gifted, and Black, where those are, like, independent organizations and you know, it's much more important for them to have social media platforms as to where, like, black student unions within the University of California college system, we can communicate with each other, like, using our platforms that are on social media without really getting out there. So if you would ask most black student union members, like, how are we, like, most of them would say that we're communicating very well, we're communicating very well amongst each other. And there's not a lot of concern right now to get that out because we're still working. We're still trying to find out what the what, what the real common thread between all of our various sure. organizations are. Because um, a lot of us have a lot of different opinions as far as like what Obama did. You know, who wants to negotiate with Trump? Who wants to protest against Trump? You got the homosexual community, the transgender community, and there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of uh, differing politics. So we're really trying to find out how we can coalesce and form these powerful coalitions, hence the African Black Coalition. Okay. And we have a call. We have a question from a caller. Caller, are you there? Good morning. Yes, I am. Good morning, my King Kenny, uh, my Queen Colette, and uh, my King Damien. Uh, thank you for having this gentleman on this morning. Wow. Thank you for being uh, with us, Andrea. Just, uh, whoa. Colette told me who your guest was going to be today. Um, I said I wanted to pick a real quiet spot. And as to Colette's uh, recommendation, I'm sitting in that quiet spot right now, uh, looking at the hills here in um, Altadena, California, where it's also cold. But I'm originally from Oakland, so and I've been away for a long time, but I want to reconnect. Um, and I remember the Black Panthers when I was little. Um, the original Black Panthers. So I thank you, my King Damien, for taking on what you've done uh, with some of the programs that you've there in San Francisco. Has it been a ripple effect at all to any other colleges that have seen what you've done and they have taken it to start those similar programs in other colleges, uh, if not in California, throughout the country? Most definitely. And again, um, I started at Santa Rosa, at Santa Rosa Junior College, and now I'm going to San Francisco State. Uh, but I would say yes. Uh, one of my best friends that, you know, I started the Black Student Union with at Santa Rosa Junior College, 
um, when I first met him, he was majoring in uh, pre-med, you know, microbiology and things like that, and uh, he was shadowing doctors, and he was kind of getting his, he was a young brother, really kind of getting his feel for the activist vibe. Um, he liked a lot of the stuff that I was talking about, a lot of the information I was bringing to the table, and um, he brought it to my attention that he wanted to get more involved. And I was like, yo, get more involved, my brother. If this is where your heart is at, if this is what you're really passionate about, then this is where you need to be. So he actually ended up switching his major from pre-med to sociology. That brother, his name is Elias Hennett. He is now the president of the Black Student Union at UC Berkeley. And the things that he is doing at UC Berkeley is mind-blowing. Like the wow. – the progression that I saw in this young brother, and this is a young brother who, like I would like to say, came up under me, has taken a lot of the information and has ran with it, and has now, you know, like I said, the president of Black Student Union at UC Berkeley, which is probably one of the most prestigious public universities in the country, and mm -hmm. they are definitely yes. expanding on a lot of the programs that we did um, at start at San Jose Junior College. So yes, it is definitely spreading. But again, a lot of these various black student unions within these different colleges throughout the state, they have their own identity. They have their own like way of doing things. They have their own particular thread of ideology that runs through them. And we're really trying to figure out how can we all align our various clubs on the common thread of black liberation. Wow. Damien, You've got so much excitement in your voice, and I hear it, and I'm motivated and inspired by it. And what I'm interested in knowing is how can that number of 1,500 be turned into 15,000, 150,000, 1 million, 500, 5 million? How can we replicate this? How can we turn this into a movement? And as you're speaking and you're talking about the lack of a common thread, it's really, really quite interesting. And Ken and I have this conversation daily. We are the elders, and we absolutely need to be a part of what this movement is and what it is about. And it's unfortunate that we're faced with such division and and. First, we have to heal those wounds and and fill that gap. But we're the elders, and the younger generation comes on the heels of what we have done, or lack thereof. And I do remember our first conversation with you. It was a fiery conversation because you were telling us what we ain't done. <laughs> and you know what? Uh, you're right, and we have some ideas about what we have not done, who dropped the ball, and you are right. I am a baby boomer. Ken and I are baby boomers, and yes, we dropped the ball because we were told by the millennials, my daughter for one, that we're old and outdated, and we matter none, which of course is wrong. However, We've not done what we were supposed to do. So what you're doing should have been done a long time ago, and we've got to keep it moving, keep it moving. We've got to build upon this. And 1,500 people at the coalition, this woman who went on Facebook had massive numbers. The numbers are still coming in. I'm sure there were 5 million people worldwide that marched on Saturday. Cities all over the country. Come on, folks. Come on. And it takes you, Damien Square, a millennial, to pull this together and say, we've got to create a common thread. We have to create a common mission. We have to create a common reason why. We have to create a set of values that says, we all need to do this and bring this together for us. We cannot wait for them to do it for us or to tell us when to do it or to give us permission to do it. We've got to do it for ourselves. And before I get on my regular soapbox, Damien, go ahead. 
continue. Tell us more. So I was, I was going to just answer your question and say that um, when you really think about it, it's, it's overwhelming of, like, what can we do to kind of get ourselves up to that speed. But I would say it really – you want to first think about what can you do as an individual. individual. What can mm-hmm. I do individually to change things in my community? And right. the first thing is find out what local organization, community organization – um, and your community is actually affecting change. Enjoy that. Um, but there's a quote by Marcus Garvey where he says, um, a people without past history, without past knowledge of their history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. So right. it is very, it's very important that we, we gain that insight <clears throat> from the elders who've, who've already, they've been through a lot of the, the rigmarole of white right. supremacy. You're right. And mm-hmm. there's a lot that we can You're learn. Right. But, right. But You're absolutely each, right. Going back to the individual level, level, though, each community, each black community must identify the problems and develop solutions within their community. And the stakeholders, with, the stakeholders that are within that community must prioritize and direct local and state resources to that community. Um, on a larger level, federal resources must strategically be allocated so that local communities can solve the problems that are specific to them. And this is where we start getting into the the situation with Donald Trump and people saying that that's not my president. And, you know, like, the fact of the matter is he is the president. And we would be... Wait, 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 Damon, 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 please don't say that. Please don't say that, Damon. Oh, gosh. But the, the, I understand, I understand, but the, the fact of the matter is he is the president, and we would be fools Damon, if we Damon, did not. I haven't had breakfast yet. Please, you're, you're <laughs> nauseating me. I have not had breakfast yet. You're nauseating me. Well, look, this is, this, is, and this is a part, I, I understand the comedy. <laughs> what you're saying, but this it ain't is comedy, part, it's real. I know, but this that is ain't part, comedy, this, that is real. That is a part of the huge problem of why we're in the situation that we're in because we mm-hmm. the older generation the civil rights, they didn't want to face their fears and now you you know and i don't want to be any dis i don't want to be disrespectful and say because they did but you face your fears when you go into a restaurant and get busted upside the head with a billy club you know when you know that they said you're supposed to be in there but when they convinced us to close down our schools, to convince us to close down our businesses, convince us to close down our banks, to integrate with them, and convincing us that us integrating with them would be better for us as a collective, like the civil rights generation failed us in that way because the true battle was to be fought right then and there. There was a lot more blood that needed to be shed to liberate black people from the clutches of white supremacy. And sure. truth uh-huh. be told, truth be well, told, in right. order for us, in order, in order, in order for us to fully be liberated from white supremacy in this country, there's there's going to have to be a revolution that takes place, and there's no such thing as a bloodless revolution. So either that revolution is going to take place, or we're going to adopt a pan-Africanist ideology, and we're going to try to start realigning with our brothers and sisters on the continent, which is where my heart is at. My heart is in Pan-Africanism, and I believe in order for us to really be liberated, we have to start building those bridges to get back to our roots. Mm-hmm. And and I don't disagree with you at all. I don't disagree with you. And we were... Well, I, 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 I will have to say that I disagree with the fact that we didn't do enough during the Civil Rights Movement. I, I, think, I think you, you may be um, underestimating of some of the things that were done out there. There was a lot of bloodshed. There were a lot of uh, uh, there were there were protests, there were marches all over college campuses and there were protests in communities. There were fights in communities. I remember in Pasadena, California, when they were building um the freeway, the two ten freeway. Oh yeah. And and all the older brothers came down with shotguns and this was before Reagan came in and changed gun laws. California. We stood, and I was probably in the 10th grade, we stood on this woman's porch with the older brothers having shotguns, daring the the uh, the police and the construction people from tearing her house down. Now, 
she eventually did because you know obviously things happened, people get arrested and those things. But we were out there, we were we were out there in nine thousand. We had brothers in Vietnam and it were coming back to Vietnam. There was a lot of a lot of things going on and it wasn't just, yeah. in, that, in that sense it wasn't that we dropped the ball. But we did a lot of things in terms of moving moving forward. You know, we, we had the the Martin Luther King movement of, of peace and, and don't fight back. We had the Malcolm X sect that was, you know, uh, by But see the fact of the sect. matter is the fact of the matter is that has done nothing what has that done for black black community? And the fact is we have not moved one iota. That the, those changes were illusions. Those were the illusion of inclusion. Just because we are able to go to the same restaurant as white people, right. just because we're able to go to the same uh, uh, hotel as them, mm-hmm. we're equal. No. The fact is, in 1865, during the Emancipation Proclamation, African Americans as a whole owned less than one half of 1% of this nation's entire wealth. Here we are, 150 years later, 2017 with Barack Obama, with Oprah Winfrey, with Tiger Woods, LeBron James, Michael Jordan, African Americans as a whole still own and control less than one half of 1% of this nation's entire wealth. So the fact is, the civil rights movement didn't do a damn thing. And what we have to yeah. really do, what we have to really do is be, is, is be honest about that. And the small changes that the civil rights movement did was just eroded a Supreme Court decision that totally reversed the Voting Rights um, Act. So what we have to do is like we have to be very honest with ourselves in these in these trying times that we're in right now, and we have to be very unapologetic about how we move forward for the liberation of Black people. Um, I'm, this is Scotty. Okay, I'm okay. the in, hello. This is Scotty. I'm the engineer. So, Scotty. Uh huh. Yeah, uh, we got about four minutes uh, left, but I just wanted to say say to the young brother Damien again, thank you for coming on and speaking. But I think we're underestimating the the tremendous damage that COINTELPRO Pro uh, did to our community, um, killed our leaders. The U.S. government admitted to the assassination plot of MLK. We know the FBI orchestrated the murder of Malcolm X. Um, We still got Black Panthers in prison as political prisoners. And I think, you know, that if we acknowledge that, because it's not widely known, then we won't be so hard on our elders in in that regard, um, because a lot of them don't even know about that. And also, in terms of the younger generation, they still, COINTELPRO is still in effect, in my opinion. So, I, you know, I, I, I do agree with you in that, you know, integration did not do much in terms of black liberation or equality. But COINTELPRO really, 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 really uh, derailed the movement of our elders, and, and, and they're trying to do it now with the new movement with the younger people. Those are my comments. Thanks. Most definitely, Thank I would definitely agree with that, Scotty. Um, Marcus Garvey was the first victim of, of of what we would call COINTELPRO, and COINTELPRO definitely had did its damage, and it put a lot of our community and a lot of our people in a paralyzed state of fear. But due to that paralyzed state of fear, countless other Lives have been lost and are continuing to be lost. The Tim, the Tamir Rice's, the Rakesha Boyd, right, the Trayvon right. Martins, the Michael Brown. So until until we decide to stand up toe to toe with white supremacy, and I don't mean like go out and okay corral, grin it out with white supremacy because we know that ain't gonna work. But until right. we decide to stand up toe to toe and define ourselves as a nation within the nation and grow ourselves economically so that we can literally pay, pay for the politics in this country because via Citizens United, which was a bill that was passed that basically says that uh, an a, a, a individual can donate unlimited campaign contributions to it. Right, right. Anonymously. Right. So that right there throws democracy out of the door. The, the, a, a regular person cannot compete with the billionaire Koch brothers that are donating to whatever, that's right. whatever candidate that they want to win. Right. So we got to right. start really playing the game to win. That's right. That's right. And, Damien, I am, I am just incredibly sorry. I am so, so sorry. 
we're going to have to close the show. We just don't have enough time. We're going to bring you back with more time. We've got so much more, and you've got so much to say and so much to offer. We greatly appreciate your coming on and being with us this morning. An hour goes by so fast. So thank you very, very, very much. We appreciate it. Keep up the momentum. Keep doing this, Damien. You've got to keep this going. You've got to keep it going. So we thank you very, very much. And we will be chatting with you very soon. And also one more thing before we go, we invite you to share an afternoon of music and the spoken word brought to you by the Hazel Catherine Vance Institute for the Arts featuring the Vance Family and Friends Choral. Lois Edwards and Dr. Ruth Beth Green are directing on Sunday afternoon, January 29th, 2017 at 3.30 p.m. at the Christ Temple Church of Christ Holiness, USA at 3125 West 54th Street in L.A., where Bishop Emery Lindsay is pastor. The admission is free, and for more information, please contact Connie Bass at 626-529-3986. 3986, and remember, that's an afternoon of music and the spoken word brought to you by the Hazel Catherine Bass Institute for the Arts. And again, thank you, Damien Square. Thank you for being with us, and we will hear from you and speak with you again. Take care, everyone. Signing off. Signing. Thank you.